Shom Rabyug. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the tiny room. Welcome back to On Shom Rabyug. I am the Michael of Michael and Benjamin podcast. I am significantly less exhausted this week than previous weeks. And I am joined by the man who has legitimately been described as the best interviewer in the Irish comic con and cosplay scene. It's Benjamin <laughs> Coffey. Oh, Michael, I don't know what to do if you compliment me at the start of the podcast. No, it wasn't me. I didn't say it. Someone else said it. <laughs> I know, but I still don't know what to do with that. So I'm going to skip straight to the theme music. <laughs> Theme music for the podcast We don't actually have any theme music Very good. Unexpected. <laughs> There's a lot of comedy in the unexpected, Ben. That's what there people is. say. And that's pretty much where I live, Michael. <laughs> Speaking of things, though, Ben, which were not unexpected. A nice little twist for you. Uh, bloody Dark Phoenix has bombed officially. Well, that was... That was always going to happen, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I have nowhere to go with Look, that. Look, Ben, I don't have any analysis of that either from a box office perspective or even just a funny perspective. It's just, yeah, it's it was. It is what it is. It wasn't very good. It wasn't very good. And not only was it not very good, it was kind of hung out to dry. Yeah, it was left. Once it was, yeah. They, they, they were, they, they, yeah. They kind of just scapegoated those those lads that made that film and they yeah. were like, yeah, no. no this no. is shite here. Look, we're going to put it out anyway, but it's shite. You don't have to go see it, but it's shite though. You can go see it if you want, but it's, it's a load of, it's a load of it's a, it's a load, it's a load of Mickey. Um, no good, no good. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't well, Disney has Disney has paid notice, Michael. Yes, because they have shut down all Fox productions. No oh, good. Outside of one particular property, which I can't remember, Aliens? which isn't great. Deadpool. Deadpool. Yeah, Deadpool is making his transition over to the Marvel universe. Oh. He's going to be making his first appearance as a cameo in one of the Disney Plus series. Is he? Yeah. No, he is. He's going to be in the Black Widow. He's going to be in the Black Widow. Black Widow's a movie, not a. No, maybe film. then it's Falcon and. Hang on. Ben, I look it up. I look it up. You tease me. I'm not teasing you. Me. Look, come here. Come here. You know, if another thing that made it across with Deadpool was the kind of the depiction of the mutants from the Deadpool series, I'd be happy enough with that. What is funny like, little lad? Like? No, I mean that Colossus is great looking. He's a deadly Colossus. He's a very good Colossus, and he would fit nicely into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He'd, you, he'd he'd slip on in no bother. He wouldn't slip in no bother. He'd probably have to be lubricated with some WD forty. Yeah, thanks to made of metal. Thanks to two extremely successful R-rated films, Deadpool uh, was one of Fox's most successful properties before the merger. Um, What's this, Ben? Is this the reading from the internet? According, podcast? yeah, that's exactly keep, what it is. Keep it brief. Keep um, it brief. Um, and it's the Black Widow movie. He'll be in the Black Widow movie. No, he won't, Ben. <laughs> Who says that? Looper? Buzzfeed? What uh, culture? One of those shite boxes? I don't know. The I, New York Times? This is showbiz chi <laughs> <laughs> Ben, don't give away our secrets. <laughs> People aren't going to listen to the podcast if they can just go www.showbizchichi.com. Mm, fair enough. This episode uh, brought to you by showbizchichi.com. Uh, yeah, but apparently it's going to be, he's going to have a little cameo um, like a little picture that he carries around his neck. Yeah, a little picture. Oh, look at you! With I the, know the with the Victorian is. reference uh, to little, what a cameo is. Little Victorian joke for you there. Look at you! Don't that get many of those for your money. Welcome back to the Victorian nostalgia show, <laughs> Ben. What's going to happen with New Mutants? It's gone. Is it? It never existed. Do you think we'll ever see it? No, Maisie Maisie Turner is it Maisie Turner? Maisie Williams. Maisie Williams. Thank you. She's in it. She's in it, but she's fairly certain you're never going to see it. In fact, she was quoted as saying, I don't, "Who knows when the fuck that'll come out?" Did she say those exact? Yeah, words? Yeah, she said those exact words, <laughs> which I quite enjoyed from Maisie Williams, cutting through the studio bullshit to just be like, "Nah." <laughs> Someone else is in it who I quite like. Oh, the your one, the blonde one who yeah. was in Split, Anna something. She was going to play magic. She would have been a good magic. She would have been a good magic. Yes. And that drugs guy was in it from Stranger Things. Oh, but he's not there anymore because it's not. I think it's going to come out. I think it'll come out on a streaming service very quietly, or they might even re-edit it to make it even more disconnected from the Marvel universe and just call just it as a horror movie, like yeah, Ghost House, <laughs> Ghost Asylum, Ghost Asylum, Werewolf Girl, yeah, Werewolf Girl in Ghost House. That's what they call it. Um, what are we talking about? This is I can't believe we haven't been hired by Hollywood yet. <laughs> I can't just, believe we're waiting this long. At least writing the bloody names for just, films. Just gems. Werewolf Girl in Ghost House 2. I mean, what a win. It sounds Japanese. It does, doesn't it? It, it sounds distinctly like a very successful Japanese. Do you know what I found out about Hente, Michael? 
<laughs> of all things that you're into isn't it. this fascinating <laughs> well no but also because it was that mainly came about um due to the restrictions placed on after world war Two on porn and things like that the japanese com- uh, government clamped down and the reason hentai was released is because um they used non-male things as a form of penetration yeah in comic books and it became an inspirational thing tentacles yeah yeah isn't that weird now I did actually know that, Ben. There's a whole, there's a very, there's some very interesting documentaries on the effect of Americanization on Japanese culture post World War Two. Apparently, before World War Two, they were a very liberal, sexually liberal society. Doesn't shock me. No, not like bloody hentai. No, that bloody no. shock you right up the butt. That's yeah. That's yeah. Maybe that's, maybe you have an electric octopus hunting you down. Yeah, sticking his tentacles um, up your butt. Sticking his tentacles up your butt. Speaking Ooh. of things going up the butt, Ben, yeah. uh, The Boys has been renewed for season two. Of course it has. It's fucking great. And it, the most watched thing ever on Amazon Prime. Yes. Well, it's not a not tough competition. No, that's true. Do you think Amazon Prime is going to suffer, or The Boys even, is going to suffer from the 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 algorithm issue that has affected Netflix shows? What would that be now? You're going to have to... Now, Ben, when you're watching a show... Mm-hmm. The, the the streaming networks get money. They shows benefit them by attracting new subscribers. Yes, and after two seasons, everyone who's going to watch the boys will have already subscribed to Amazon Prime, and they're locked in, and they're locked in, and they won't cancel their subscription because there isn't a season three of the boys. Okay, which makes it financially unlikely for shows to get more than three seasons on streaming services. Huh. Because it's not worth it. Statistically speaking, there's no long-term benefit. Exactly. That's weird. Isn't it? That's sad. It's a paradigm shift in the world of entertainment. Yeah. You wouldn't be getting 15 seasons of Bloody Supernatural if it was on a streaming service. I'm not sure that's a bad thing. Eric Bloody Kripke. It, well, he also produces The Boys. I oh, know, that's a link. <laughs> that's, 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 that's a tenuous like, link. It, is it Eric Kripke ducked out of the show a long time ago. Eric Kripke is the creator, but he's no longer the showrunner. Or He's anything the like of the boys, it. Isn't he? He's the showrunner of the boys. He's too busy. Too Supernatural. Busy he left Supernatural at its peak. He didn't do any of this faff with extending it beyond its shelf life. Ben. He was the one who was pushing for three Trend tight seasons. Season four. Ben, having seen all of the boys, yes, and the very quick announcement of season two, it's just like boom, we're doing all it. All of the season two is coming. Do you suspect, Ben, as I do, that season two is actually already largely filmed? Because it's not actually season two. It's the back end of season one, which was filmed as a 16 issue episode. Really? Show. Uh, this is apropos of nothing then. Purely speculation Pure on your part, Pure speculation. Michael. But I have a feeling that well, the film... Well, 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 did they? Well, well. well. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it could be. I'm, I'm okay with that because I think the first half of season one was fucking great. Because <laughs> it very much felt like a, a mid-season can, can finale. Yeah, there weren't, there weren't a lot of things that came... Not full a lot got wrapped there. up. Not a lot got wrapped up. A lot of cliffhangers. A lot of cliffhangers. Real we'll do full spoilers a little bit later on, but we're not going to do them right now. Real mid-season finale. Yeah, it, it did have it did have a distinctly mid-season finale vibe. Good mid-season finale, though. Very good. Very entertaining. Very entertaining. Um, I, I don't know if it's going to suffer from the same algorithm issue because Amazon is its own monster I outside of a streaming the same service. Thing, though. It's going to be the same thing. It's going to be, if it's not drawing in new viewers, if it's not attracting new subscribers, what's, it's not the, a viable what's, business model. what's the value of it? Mm. You're spending that money, you could be spending on adapting bloody... And... Lock and key. No, not lock and key. Um, they should adapt lock and key. They've tried twice. Yeah, it doesn't go well for them any time no. they give it a go. Uh, try and adapt the bloody Marvel encyclopedia. No, that's an encyclopedia. No, that that's won't work. Series. The authority? If you can get away with the boys, you can do the authority. Well, I mean, the, the boys is essentially another form of the authority. It's all Mark Miller hates superheroes. Uh, look, he just ruined the industry at some point. So it's not <laughs> his fault. He's making lots of money. Ben! Yeah. I had a day of sitting around yesterday. Good and for you. I watched from start to finish in one sitting the entirety of season 10 of Archer. Good for you. Ben, it came out in March. It did. You didn't bloody tell me. I, I didn't. <laughs> yep. I wasn't aware you were a massive Archer fan. I love Michael, Archer. this is news to me. Um, I wasn't a huge fan of the last two seasons. I didn't particularly like the detective season or the nah. Trapped on the Island season. Nah. But Ben, season 10, let me tell you, ticked all of my boxes. But it's very sci-fi based, mm. Michael. Classic. Nom, 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 there are a nom, lot of nom. Oh, God. Um, there are a lot of 90s sci-fi tropes I running through that I sat there all series. day yesterday, ticking my boxes. Oh, 
Listeners, you can turn off now. It's uh, <laughs> it's bloody great. Yeah. Um, yeah, they hit all the tropes, all the themes. Um, sexy barbarians in space. Yeah, who doesn't love a sexy barbarian in space? A, a ragtag bunch of people on a spaceship. Yeah. Mysteries on a planet. Bloody classic fucking evil Ripley si- territory. Evil cyborgs. Yeah. It's bloody brilliant. It's all there, Barry the evil cyborg. Barry Six. It's Not Barry Keegan, who's great. Barry Keegan's great. We love Barry Keegan. Yeah, although if it was a cyborg, he could write more comics faster, I, I assume. And then we get to read more Barry Keegan stuff, which would be See great. What I'm See yeah. what I'm saying? I've told Barry, ben, saying. I've told Barry Keegan uh, that, actually I said on Instagram, that the Dark Pool had a panel which made me laugh more than any panel in comics this year. What's that? I'm not going to reveal it until the collected issue comes out, but I'll show you later. Yeah, great. <laughs> it's um, but yeah, I'm... Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of Barry Keegan stuff. And also Archer season 10. Yeah. <laughs> Barry does listen to the podcast, so how are you, Barry? Um. <laughs> got a bit distracted there. Sorry. Uh, yeah, it's brilliant, Ben. Everyone should watch Archer season 10. I don't think it's as funny as other seasons of Archer. It, it lost... You see, this is the thing. Archer actually grew as a show as time went by. Mm-hmm. And that became a complicated thing for the writers to kind of uh, stride between. Because they have moments of like supreme sentimentality I always remember the episode where um, Archer finds himself on an island with a lost Japanese oh, that's soldier yeah and he puts poo on the sticks I mean that's very funny but he also has this very strange moment where he realises what the Japanese 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 uh, Japanese man has been through and he's like oh I'm so sorry that happened to you that's awful yeah. and it's just a very emotional moment you're like this this is not what I watch Archer for god damn it <laughs> it's very good though yeah, it's very good there's there's Star Trek stuff there's Ridley Scott's Alien stuff there's oh it's brilliant I love H. John Benjamin he's a very good he's a very good he's voice a actor. great voice actor I my my weird thing that I've always kind of found odd about Archer is that every character in it looks quite a lot like their actor except, except him <laughs> like, except for him they could totally do a live action version Yes. Except for him. <laughs> Except for him. He couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, it just wouldn't work. No. But, oh, bloody hell, yeah, it was really good. Uh, a, a bit of a dissatisfying ending. Oh, no. Did you see the ending? I haven't seen the ending. Do you want me no. to... Ah, go on. Go on, go will on. I do a spoiler go for Archer? Lean it? into it, spoiler. He wakes up from his coma. Oh, fuck. Yeah, so he's back in the... The real world. The, re- the real world, as it were. As it were. As it were. We're not getting season 11, are we? It's yeah, I think so. Are we? Yeah, possibly without showrunner... Hit me up there, Ben. Who's the showrunner? I don't know the showrunner. I've his name. Archer. Never Sorry. Mind. Oh, well. Speaking, that was a weird pause. Speaking, yeah, speaking of uh, classic Hollywood, Ben. Yeah, go on. You and I both saw a film this week. We did. Not together, though. No, you separately. Went with, you went with your brother. I'm doing air quotes there. Your was, brother. What's my brother? I know. The, well, your brother. <laughs> Why are you doing Sorry. air quotes? It sounds sarcastic. It, it's true, it's your brother. Uh, yes, I went with my brother and, and you went with your, your brothers in spirit. I only went with Shane. Your brother in spirit. Yeah. I thought was, Jim would go. No, uh, Jim he, would go? Jim, no, he was too busy. Look, Ben, the film we went to see was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It was, it was. It was <sighs> did I call you, did I call you Ben there? Yeah. <laughs> did you I call you Jim or Shane? No, you called me Ben. Uh, hold on, I'm going to do that again because I want to do a funny intonation on it and I ended up saying it correctly. Ben, the film we went to see was Once Upon a Time. In Hollywood. <laughs> Put the intonation in all the wrong places and know, it on my soul. It was good, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, we did go see that. It, it's ah. Benjamin, we've not really talked about Quentin Tarantino much. Do you say Quentin or Quentin? No, it's Quentin. It's Quentin, Quentin Tarantino. Quentin. Or unless he's very, very French, in which case it's Quentin. Quentin. Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> Quentin Tarantino. Uh, but yeah, uh, I don't know why we had a bit of French bashing there, but we did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, we both went to see it. I, uh, Quentin Tarantino is probably the first time I realised what a, a technically well-made film was when mm. I was a teenager. It was the first time that I kind of understood that you can do a lot of things to bring a sense of continuity to a film, to bring a sense of style to a film, to make things comes full to make things come full circle um and that was the first time i kind of noticed that in pulp fiction um and i've had quite a, a love hate relationship with some of quentin tarantino stuff go on um for example i think that inglorious bastards is probably his best film do you and yet and yet go on there's so much over the topness to that film mm-hmm. um and yet i think it was a very good film i think pulp fiction is his best film yeah, I could also give you that one. Because it is. 
because okay fair enough uh, I don't have much to argue with there um, but yeah so I think we both I think we're both Temi fans of, of I'm a, I would you know we don't talk about Quentin's work very much on the podcast no. but I, you know I've seen all of his films multiple times and enjoyed most of them yeah um, don't have a huge love for The Hateful Eight The Hateful Jackie Eight Brown. was awful and Jackie Brown is just a weird thing that existed <laughs> they're yeah no, they're, they're probably my least favourite too um, yeah I'm not a huge Reservoir Dogs guy which like is Reservoir sacrilege Dogs of a sort I'm, I'm assuming but anyway go on I was really disappointed when I saw The Hateful Eight go on because I thought it was a very poor film very messy very over did the top so? did you think so um, but it doesn't matter what I think Michael no but critics tended to agree with me and yeah. so did audiences because it's his poorest, poorest reviewed film is it? It is. I didn't know that. Um, and it was to be his final one. He was to retire after The Hateful Eight. I thought he was doing 10. No, no. He he had said that it was the final film from Quentin Tarantino. He said this a few times. Right. But thankfully, Michael, yes. that is not the case. And we got doing, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Instead. He's doing 9 now. He's doing 9 now and possibly 10. Maybe he is doing 10 now. I think he is doing I 10. I don't know. But um, I really enjoyed Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I've only seen Death Proof once. Death Proof wasn't very good. <laughs> I don't think you are a Quentin Turner. No, no, I, I definitely am. I love Django. I think it's a really interesting film. I'm a big fan of Inglorious Bastards. I love Pulp Fiction. Um, Kill Bill is interesting. Volume 1 more than Volume 2. But no, I'm a big Quentin Tarantino fan. Like, there's no getting around it. I enjoy the way he writes dialogue and I enjoy... And I think as he got older, that weird on-the-nose dialogue, unnatural dialogue, got mm-hmm. replaced by a stylized kind of natural dialogue that he has. I think that the scene in Inglorious Bastards with Hans Landa and the the French farmer mm-hmm. and Michael Fassbender in a German tavern. Two very good scenes. Two excellent scenes in terms of how you build tension and use dialogue. Let's very talk clever. about let's talk about bloody Once upon a, a Once Upon a Time. Once Once Upon a Time. In, in Hollywood. Hollywood. Um yeah, so I think one of the interesting things that I had in this experience, and there's going to be spoilers ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah, Are yeah, we yeah, doing yeah, spoilers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're doing full spoilers. It's full. Let's, just, let's do a little spoiler break. Spoiler break. Spoiler break. Don't listen if you don't want to hear any spoilers about the film. Once upon a time, Hollywood. That was quite nice. It was very soothing. <laughs> yeah, it was very soothing. If anyone, spoiler break if anyone wants to adapt that into an actual little segment, we'd, we'd love to have a spoiler song. That's um, really um, that was quite nice. Um, so... One of the interesting things that happened is my brother is not aware of Charles Manson uh, history. Inverted commas. And Charles Manson plays a central role or the the cult of Charles Manson and who Charles Manson was plays a central role in this film. Although Charles Manson is barely in it. Um, he is, but the, his ideology and the effect he had on young people in Hollywood at the time is very much one of the central parts of the entire um Film. Go on. And what was interesting is my brother didn't know any of that. Right. So I was watching the film with much more tension than he was. Because he wasn't ready if he didn't know. He was watching the film from a fictional point of view. Hmm. Because the three main characters that we follow in... In the film. In the film. Rick Dalton um, and Brad uh, Brad Pitt's character who's Cliff... Cliff... Cliff Clifferson. Cliff Ste- is it Cliff Steele? It's Cliff, not Cliff Clifferson, Steel. I Cliff think. Cliff Steele is from... Bloody Doom Patrol. Um, But it's Cliff. Cliff and Rick Dalton. One is an aging actor who's struggling to hang on to his relevance. Mm -hmm. And the other is a stuntman who may or may not have killed his wife. Yeah. He (laughs) He definitely did. He definitely did. Definitely killed his wife. Um, And those are two the main characters. But then we follow another. Those two are fictional. Rick Dalton and and Cliff are two fictional, fictional characters. Um, Two made up boys. Two made up boys. Um, And they're kind of, uh, I suppose, Quentin Tarantino's little love letter to Hollywood as a concept. Yeah, they represent old Hollywood. Yeah, they represent old Hollywood. And then there's an interesting switch because he puts old Hollywood right next to fictional old Hollywood in his in his mind and then we meet Sharon Tate who was a real person who was played by Margot Robbie a real bloody tragic person a real tragic person and this is my issue with the film so the culmination of the film oh we're talking straight to the culmination just just to get it out of the way and we can cover the rest of it what makes it complicated is is Quentin Tarantino takes a trip down time machine lane again the way he did in Inglorious Bastards where he has a group of ragtag guys murder Hitler yeah. Which isn't how Hitler died. No. As far as we know. We don't know though. Uh, we don't it's, know. Let's see you prove it. But I think what we do know is that Sharon Tate was the wife of Roman Polanski. Yes. And she and three other friends were murdered horrifically by followers of Charles Manson. Yes. Um in their home. Yes. 
And Quentin Tarantino, and the reason the film is called Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, has taken that story and given it a happy ending. Yes. Where... Not a wank. No, 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 no. Uh, a, non, a non-massage parlour happy ending. Yes. Uh, more of a narrative happy ending, if yes. you will. A very happy ending. A very happy ending. And it's very complex because what happens is Rick Dalton comes out, sees these guys, hates hippies, hates, hates, hippie, them, hates them, and has a good old scream match at them. He yeah. pisses them off so much that they come up to his house mm-hmm. and what ensues is one of the most Quentin Tarantino but well placed scenes I think oh. I've ever come across in a film such violence uh, such violence and he restrains himself throughout the entire no film. violence in the rest of the film it is so clean and yeah. this is why I was really impressed by the film I was like he is just holding back Very and then swearing. on a dime oh holy he God. just flicks it on it's one whistle from the dog and we're away oh. and I will never get over I will never get over Brad Pitt fastballing a can of dog food, that dog food at a small Asian American woman right in the face. He smashed her face in with he that dog food. He smashed her face in with the dog food. And you believe that that thing connected. I don't know oh, what yeah. way they filmed it, but you see it and you feel it. Me and my brother were like... <laughs> yeah, very painful. It was so jarring as a concept. And then it went completely over the top. There was a flamethrower. It was amazing. But my issue with it, Go I on. enjoyed the film thoroughly. I don't know if you get to rewrite that bit of history. I don't know if that's... What do you get to? Well, he, he's gotten to, but I don't know if it's a tasteful thing to do. Is I, that a tasteful thing to do? I I mean, it was certainly cathartic. For him? For everyone. It was the most satisfying bit of screen violence I think I've ever seen in oh, my Oh, that scene life. is just incredible. Just get them. I think it was get four them, Brad minutes. Pitt. <laughs> Yeah, and Brad Pitt <laughs> decimated. <laughs> By the way, Brad Pitt has returned to full sexy. Yeah. Brad Pitt has gone full loop. Goes through the loop Hollywood, yeah. he he did Hollywood gruff dad for a bit. He was just so fucking hot in that film, Michael. When that shirt came off, oh the shirt! Man. Oh sweet That's Jesus, like, Michael. Um, um, but you believe that he's a violent, violent man in oh, that he, film. He does he it really, so well. He really killed the shit out of those hippies. He killed, and he did it so well. I love the bit where he notices the knife in his side. He's like, well, I can't I can't let that stand. Yeah. And he just decimates that woman. He smashes her head. I've never seen a telephone used in that way. Oh, very violent. And very violent. And 66% of it aimed at women. Yeah. Well, that's Tarantino, isn't it? I think, Ben, quite a lot of this film, and we've skipped over a few points that we wanted to make, I think, but a lot of this film is Tarantino giving a little nod and a wink at himself. Some of it is most of the feet stuff is ridiculous because he has those two yeah. scenes where the feet are just smack bang in your face. Yeah. Um, and my brother again wasn't aware of that trope, and he was like, oh. "You forget to do air quotes when you say brother." Because uh, he's my real brother. I don't have to do air quotes when it's my real brother. Luke, if you're listening to the podcast, I know you don't, but if you are, if you could leave a comment somewhere nah, just to prove exist. a point. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's definitely a nod and a wink going on here and there. I I did think it was a spectacularly well made film. Um, one of the scenes that I really loved is there's a kind of a cyclical ritual at the beginning of the film at the end of the film where Brad Pitt feeds the dog Yeah, um, and it's such an important film or it's such an important two scenes because it shows how disciplined the dog is mm-hmm. and it's not something that's necessarily drawn attention to over and over and over but over the course of it you find out he was in the military and because they say Brad Pitt's a war hero that's all though that's the thing. Yeah, they don't explain what it is, mm-hmm. but there are subtle hints, and I think it's a great way to build a character without like direct exposition. And when you see the dog very well behaved, and you see the whistle or the click, he goes, and then it attacks. You understand, and it fits perfectly in what you understand about that dog. Mm-hmm. It is a very well behaved, disciplined dog, and it makes sense that it is so it controlled and casual. Yeah, it just destroys the hippies. Oh my days. And I love when it finishes with one, he's just like, and he oh. sends it over to the other. And that poor young one, oh, she, she got destroyed. Even Tex, like like you said, aimed at women. Yeah. Because Tex it. gets away. No, he doesn't. Tex gets his head stomped on a curb. Yeah, but you don't see it. You do. <laughs> you do. Maybe your eyes were closed. Maybe I closed my eyes. Maybe I did. <laughs> Definitely do. It's Very close. cathartic. I think everyone in the cinema was just like, yeah. <laughs> all three of those people, well, one of them died of natural causes, but all three of them are like were alive until quite recently. Ugh. Two of them are still alive. The the woman who gets flamethrowered and Tex are both still alive and in prison. Yeah, but I think I think again it's a, probably a, a testament to Quentin Tarantino building that tension as to why it's so cathartic because you're mm. waiting for it to happen. And I know there's that extra layer of tension for people that know the story of Sharon Tate and Charles Manson's 
uh, followers. So we were all watching it thinking, is this how the film ends? Does it end sadly at, at the end of, is this how it ends? And no. I watched it, Ben, with a conceit that I didn't know what was going on. And I kept leaning over to Shane and telling him, I think they're in some sort of cult. <laughs> I don't think he thought it was funny, but I did. I, are you sure you did? You love a conceit, Michael. Um, one of my favourite things was that Bruce Lee was a real dick. He's getting in a lot of trouble for that. Well, Have you heard about this? With getting in a lot of trouble with Bruce Lee's daughter, who basically never met Bruce Lee. Has a podcast all about his philosophy, though. Did you know that? Yeah, but she not a very good, not a very good podcast. Never met him. Yeah, not a very good podcast. About Bruce Lee's philosophy. Um, she takes different segments of what he would have said over time and they deconstruct it and show how you can apply it to your normal life. Well, she's probably just upset that her career is ending. <laughs> well, that's possibly what it is because I don't think anyone came out of that film. But he was, I, I, I can't say I've never met Bruce Lee. No, no, um, But it wasn't a stretch for me. No. I've seen interviews. Uh, my, yeah, he was an arrogant man. Yeah. And there's there seem to be two camps of people who are annoyed about it. There's the people who are saying that how could Bruce? How could Brad Pitt beat him in a fight? And there's people who are saying, "Yeah, my levels do look yeah. low there. It'll be fine." And um, there are people who are saying, "How very dare they have him be a dick?" Why well, do but, I? Do, I don't see what the problem with him being a dick is. I don't see what the problem is. Brad, Brad Pitt beating him in a fight. It's really weird how Bruce Lee, by dying young, developed a legend of being untouchable. Yeah, I I didn't understand that. I, and he gets the first hit, and he's like, "Okay, that's a good one, Kato." <laughs> and he gets up, and he goes, "Try that again." And it's just Brad Pitt just in control, and he fucks him into that car. That's brilliant. And again, maybe you're right. That's a per. I've never looked at it that way, Michael. I really like that phrase that you come cathartic violence. He was very cathartic. Quentin Tarantino has a knack for cathartic violence. Well, and I'm not sure it's something that we should laud or praise. But you enjoy a punch in a Quentin Tarantino film or you mm. enjoy a hit in a Quentin Tarantino film. Yeah, there's a relish to it. I don't know how to quite... Most of the time, I mean... I know, you, sometimes you, he goes way over. I don't even mean that, but I think he has good control over it because you certainly didn't enjoy the the violence of the Mandingo fighting. No, exactly. I ben. No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. Or the, I lost a lot lynching. of money on that fight. Um... <laughs> That was only last week. Um, but yeah, no, you're right. He seems to have, he seems to really be able to flick Man- it on and off. Manipulate your old emotions. Yeah, but I really enjoyed that scene. I love, my, one of my favourite scenes is the scene where you see Brad Pitt in the boat with his ex-wife, or Point, his dead wife. Pointing the gun at her. And it's just like, you just know. And again, it is really, I know some people bash Quentin Tarantino sometimes and say it's the same thing over and over, but it's when you see scenes like that and you understand he really understands how to lead an audience to where he wants them to go. He has a lot of control over what he does with the audience. I think he lost that in The Hateful Eight and he almost went overboard. I didn't enjoy The Hateful Eight. Though. No, it's not a great film. It's 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 that dog scene. It's it's the dog Brad Pitt scene yeah. for an entire film. No, it's it's not though, isn't it? The problem with it is it it thinks it's it thinks it's that. But it thinks that the first half is Hans Landa yeah maybe that's it it thinks the first half is tension filled and the second half is cathartic violence but it's not it's just huh, what else yeah it is a bit yeah it lacks I don't know it lacks some of the oomph of the other one Um, but look I really enjoyed it I will never get over the scene where it just cuts at him pointing the, the harpoon gun at her stomach Yeah, and you can just see it's great acting from Brad Pitt because he's just like slumped in the chair and you can just see he's like I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna like shoot it. <laughs> my favourite uh what was it? Evil Sexy Hamlet? Yeah, Evil Sexy Hamlet. <laughs> oh, so good. I don't like... Oh, um, one of the things that's really interesting is he didn't do it with Miramax because Miramax is gone now. That's his yeah, first well, Tarantino film outside of... The old Weinstein's not the best bunch yeah, of books. Yeah, yeah. It was interesting. There was a little touch of that with the young girl. Yeah. The eight-year-old. And then he threw her on the floor. Where he says... Yeah, but he, he says that thing where she says, uh, I don't normally like terms like pumpkin puss, mm-hmm. but since you're upset, it's okay. I also thought that was interesting that the the Manson killer lady said, TV violence made us violent, so let's kill the people who made us violent. And then Quentin Tarantino very violently kills them. Mm -hmm. So that was a... Yeah, that was probably a little little, little mouthpiece there. Um, But it was interesting. It was... um, I really enjoyed it, but I have some issues with some of it. What do you think about the complaints that people are issuing that uh, Margot Robbie wasn't utilised and that Sharon Tate... It, it underutilized women and was sexist. Why? Why was it underutilized? Why was she underutilized? Because she only has about three lines. Fair, fair. But what's 
what's the argument that she was underutilized? Well, how do you decide is, how to utilize her? The argument is that Quentin Tarantino has a very regressive, sexist view of the sixties, where men were the cool, suave, uh, and women were just I think Sharon. silent, pretty things on the side. Okay, well, that's that's definitely true. In terms of that, she probably could have a little more uh, screen presence. I think one of her key scenes where you see her power over other men is narrated by Damien something as Steve McQueen. Um, oh, where yeah. he's having the conversation with the woman at the side of the pool, which is a bizarre scene, very good. Mm. Um, where he's like, yeah, she has a thing for like 12-year-old boys with talent. He's like, yep, I never stood a chance. <laughs> and I was like, that's quite funny. I quite enjoyed that's that. Quite a funny scene. But yeah, I suppose that's a that's a fair criticism. I don't, what was the other criticism? Well, that's pretty much it. That that's it's it. a sexist, um, male-dominated 60s. Well, it absolutely is. But what representation of the 60s hasn't been that in a long time? Well, my my take on it, Ben, since you asked, which you didn't. I I'll Well, that's we're, we're having a conversation. Look, and I'm assuming ben, your take will come. My, my take on it is that it was a very respectful way to play her. Yeah, because... They played her as kind of a cipher, as a... She is a real person. Yeah, she's a real person. Um, no put words in her mouth. I think one of the nice scenes... Minus the feet is probably the scene in the cinema where she's enjoying people enjoying her work. And is that the real movie they're watching? Yeah, that's the real it's, movie they're it's watching. It's interesting yeah, to see it's, that it's not, uh, they haven't digitally replaced her. No, no, because they did it with uh, The Great Escape, which I fucking loved. That was very <laughs> Leonardo funny. DiCaprio in The Great Escape was amazing. <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio did a great job as well as this just fading actor who's trying to cling on. And I love how happy he is at the end of his Cowboys. And that's the best acting I ever saw. <laughs> Rick. Fucking done. <laughs> was just like, it was just perfect. It was just great. I loved the tension of the whole scene going up the ranch. It's just a great film. Like we've spent so much time. This is the that's longest buddy, film review we've ever let's, done. Uh, let's stop talking about it then. Ben, do a segue quick. <gasps> Jesus, that's unpleasant. That got us thinking. Um, because Quentin Tarantino, I, I found a, quite, a toned down Quentin Tarantino film. Quentin T. Quentin T. We got we got thinking. And because we've enjoyed the boys so much this week, Michael, we got thinking about some of the things that have benefited massively from toning your edge down. Yeah. From taking away the edgy thing that made them over the top, roided out muscle machines. You're holding Wolverine down there. That's a. It's very, uh, very serendipitous. I'm holding a little action figure of Wolverine, Ben. You're gonna have to explain that to Liz. No, no, he's holding actual Wolverine. Hugh Jackman <laughs> is in the studio. Uh, oh, oh, good day, everyone. I'm here. I'm Hugh Jackman. I play Wolverine on films. I'm uh, very happy to be here in Tiny Talk Studios. Tiny fucking is you. You, it's not tiny talk. It's Shomer Bjog. Shomer Bjog, that's it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. I really like making films, especially musical films, where I can show off my range. <laughs> my range. Oh fuck. Yeah. Um, yeah so we got thinking about that. Hear more about musicals. And I decided that we'd start with the boys because the boys TV series. Uh, we both finished it this week, Michael. Yeah. Um, bloody, bloody good. Very good. Uh, did we talk? Did we talk off air or on air about how that was? We talked uh, a little. We talked a little off air. air. Okay, but we talked on air about how it was. Uh, yeah, the week before we 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 did talk about how we how it had really done everything it needed to do and lost a lot of that. Wolverine's missing a claw there, Michael. He is missing a claw. Well, he is just not uh, extended that claw. Well, how did you lose a claw, Michael? I don't know. Things fall in the smaller room all the time, Ben. I know, but that's not cool. Oh no! See, do they come out? Yeah. Oh, I thought he just lost the claw. No, Ben, talk about the boys. <laughs> Sorry, that was a fascinating trip down action figure lane. Um, but yeah, so just did a fantastic job of taking all the meanness out of the comic, stripped it away. I Not all the meanness, Ben. Well, no, there are still some moments, but you need those moments for fans. Right. Because you want to get those you want to get those lads in to watch the boys. See, I couldn't say boys watch the boys. Um because the boys watch the girls, watch the boys, watch the boys and watch the Amazon Prime. Da, na, na, na. That's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> what I was saying was one of the big things is a lot of that unsympathetic malice in Butcher is gone. He's still a twat. He's a twat, as he would say. And it's recognized much quicker in the series than it ever was in the comics. I think it took eleven or twelve volumes for people to be like Oh, actually, he's unpleasant, isn't he? Maybe that psychopath is not a great psychopath. <laughs> um, but in this, he, he makes his choice at the end of the season. So, spoilers, as we said, we'll play the song. We'll insert the song there. Oh again. no, I can't I can um, remember how it goes. But um, yeah, exactly. So he makes his choice at the end of season one, where he goes off to hunt down Homelander um, instead of save the other boys. Yeah. And he marks himself out as not a great bloke. Not a good friend. Not a great bloke. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to see a lot of that. Maeve is a much more sympathetic character all of a sudden. Um, she wasn't in the comics necessarily. She always treated Starlight like a bit of a 
an object that was just to be thrown around and be kept silent. Um, but she sympathizes much quicker. I suppose that's one of the big differences. When you have real people, you have to sympathize them much quicker or you will emote with them on a much uh, faster level, I guess. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but I enjoyed the various aspects that were brought in. Um, I enjoyed the twist at the end. Um, mainly the explosion twist, not the not the... Well, the, full spoilers. We're doing spoilers. Yeah, it turns ahead. out that Butcher's wife isn't missing. No. She's been bought off by Vault. Yeah. And sent off anything. And she wasn't raped by Homelander. Or well, doesn't. We don't know. Well. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. She may have been. They said she was alone with him for three hours. And we've seen that Homelander doesn't have that much in him. Yeah. I, I don't know. In the comic books, the twist is that Black Noir is actually a clone of Homelander and he does all that. I'm not sure they're going to go with that. I had a theory, Ben, while I was watching the series that um, they mentioned that the baby was developing exceptionally fast. Yes. I had a theory that Black Noir was the baby. Ah, well, that was a good theory. That would, I would have bought that theory but at one point. Mm, it didn't pan out that way, but no. it, it turns out that she's still alive and Homelander has found out where she lives yeah. and that's probably not going to end well for her. Who is the man who plays Homelander? What's his name? Fucking great actor. He's very good, isn't he? He's bloody great. You spin your wheels there about what you thought of the series. No, uh, yeah, no, it was, a good, it was a funny little twist to bring Billy Butcher's son is alive and he's going to be... It's a big departure. Billy Butcher's son. Oh, Billy, yeah, Billy Butcher's wife's son. Yeah, there we go. Um, it's a big departure from the comic books, Ben. And a I'm very, okay with that. A very big departure from the comic books. Um, it, it'll bring a new twist to it because it's not really the comic books aren't known for their kind of family dynamics. No. Uh, that sort of tension being there. What's his name? Anthony Starr. Anthony Starr. Anthony I think you're thinking Starr. Patrick, Patrick Starr with- from, from, <laughs> from SpongeBob. Anthony Starr with two oars. Hmm. Um, he's a pretty good actor. How does he row a? How does he row a canoe? Huh? How does he row a canoe? I can't help you here. I don't know what you're with two oars. Oh, you're a son of a bitch! Oh, he was in Banshee. <laughs> That's where I know him from. Yeah, he was in Banshee. Ben. Oh my god, he, he's completely different. He's yeah, really well, he's, transformed himself for yeah, this role. It's, wow, it's a very good transformation. That's why Ben, I would like to do a Homelander costume for next year's Comic Con. Yeah, great. Let's do it. I can do a wig, look a bit like a fascist. He's so good in. He's such a menacing. I, I, I could. I found myself just agreeing with Shane every time he said he just steals every scene he's in. He's very good. He does. He's so good. He's excellent. <laughs> it was one of the best TV villains I've ever seen. There's just such a. He brings such a level of uneasiness to a show. Anyway, Ben, look, you were talking about taking the edge off something. Yeah. And making it so better. that was one good example where they took a lot of the meanness, a lot of the rape, a lot of that stuff. Far more Me Too vibes. The women get to stick up for themselves properly. Mm-hmm. They don't necessarily solve their problems through violence. Sometimes they solve their problems through taking a stand or but something like that. sometimes violence. Sometimes violence, but that's unavoidable here and there. Sometimes shooting lasers. Um, I think the Huey dynamic was much better um, because it's very cruel in the comics. Um, she gets uh, raped by the Seven. She, she gets passed around by the seven and he dumps her because of that oh, he's like oh you're such a slut and dumps her there's a lot of slut shaming in the comic um, Mark Miller has some issues he does definitely um, it's Garth Ennis not, not Mark is it Miller. Garth Ennis it's Garth Ennis it's Garth oh. Ennis' comic Garth Ennis also um, hates superheroes probably more than Mark probably Miller probably more than Mark Miller he makes them die in horrible ways um, but yeah so basically um, none of that is there he understands that her life was difficult and it's one member of the seven and she understandably when finds out that she's completely betrayed is like well fuck you then (laughs) you you big dick bag Mm. Um, and that's pretty good she took that shot from the rifle like a champ like a champ I didn't know Starlight was bulletproof I think all superheroes are to some degree bulletproof oh okay because otherwise I mean you know what I mean I'm doing a shoulder shrug motion yeah it's pretty good Otherwise, otherwise what's the point like Cyclops the point in the soup you just take him out with a yeah. gun. Yeah. But then we got talking about other um, moments where we kind of toned down our heroes as we went along because it was kind of necessary. Right, go on. At certain points. One of the, the key examples, I suppose, would be Batman. Batman's had a very up and down career when it came to the, I am vengeance, I am the knight. Um, that kind of crap. Um, <laughs> but originally, uh, he was 60s Batman. Like a lot of people grew up with Adam West well, he wasn't Batman. originally 60s Batman. Uh, no, he was originally 50s Batman and everyone was old chum. Um, well, before that even, he was a full on murderer. Uh, yeah, so original Batman was Vigilante Batman and he had an mm. L gun, he had an L pew pew. Yeah, he just shoots you in the head. Um, as soon as look at you. Very efficient. Um, and then that got reckoned over time and we got Crime, Cape Crusader Batman and then we moved into 60s Batman with Adam West, tongue-in-cheek Batman and that mm. caused a problem for 
the character. Go on. So the comics tried to match that kind of campy uh, tone. Campy tone, and that's where we got the Brave and the Bold from, which made some of the best Silver Age stories after the Golden Age. Um and that was cool. But then the the comics started to shift the tone to a darker Batman. That was the Denny O'Neill era of Batman. The eighties. Um no no, not even. That was before the eighties. That was the end of the seventies. And then a little known fella. Yeah, go on. By the name of Mark Miller. Got Frank, his hands. Frank Miller. Sorry, Frank Miller. So many Millers. Mark Miller was about ten. Um Frank Miller got his hands on Batman Year One and he did his first kind of gritty reboot. And that did very well. That yeah. was a good reimagining of the character. Um, gave him back this dark tone. It's very nice. And that's the Batman we all know and love today, the kind of vengeful um, Batman. But then, Go on. Michael, yeah. he went a step further Go on. and did a classic what if. Yeah. Um, and he put Batman in the future as an Elfler who who was pretty much a Republican wet dream um, from start to finish. Just a jacked older dude who takes the city back through force. And, and uh, chunk bat robots. Yeah. No, that's Kingdom Come. No, it's Kingdom Come. But... Um, there's a lot of violence in that comic and he's really over the top and aggressive and Mark Miller loved this representation of the character but go on and it's very Mark Miller or Frank Miller uh, Frank Miller sorry god damn it this is going to be a tough episode but go on many people had that as their (laughs) formative Batman yeah but man if you will um and that became the character, you know, the badass, beat, beat criminals to death kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But obviously, you can't keep that tone up forever because it's a little bit over the top, Michael. Go have on. you ever read The Dark Knight Returns? Of course I have. Yes, it's very aggressive, Michael. He beats up a mutant. A mutant. Um, yes, he does. A little bit of a jab at the X-Men, surely. Uh, more, more than likely, yeah, more than likely. And it's very violent. Mm-hmm. And not cathartic. Sometimes a little bit over the top. He, a little bit mean. He's a, he's a killer Batman. It's weird to have that back. So. Go on. What did we do, Michael? Well, we toned down the edge over time, Michael. Yeah. Michael we, Keaton. We we had Michael Keats. M. Keats. Um, M. Keats stepped up. Then we got the animated series. And something that had been lacking throughout much more of that was the detective aspect of Batman. The mm-hmm. cool, logical um, Batman that existed. And that was brought back a little bit in the animated series with Detective Batman. And then Grant Morrison got his hands on him and we had the JLA run where Mark, 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 where, where Grant Morrison, not Mark Morrison, oh my God, <laughs> turned him into the back god. Yeah. Um, and again, that yes. was pushed too much. And it's just interesting to see how that character has gone through the loop of edgy, not edgy, edgy, not edgy, edgy, not Joel edgy. Schumacher. <laughs> Joel Schumacher. Let's just throw it all out the window. Um, and it's it's really fascinating to kind of to see that in that character. Um, but it's nothing DC hasn't done before. I think, Ben, I kind of somewhat disagree with you a little bit there. I think Batman currently is in a bit of a limbo. No, oh, okay. I think Batman is a very poorly defined character currently in not in any specific comic or piece of media but just in the in the the collective consciousness. Yeah, what do we want to do with Batman? What is Batman? Is yeah. he a grim and gritty like down on his like a normal human fighting extraordinary things who get beat up and injured? Is he an undefeatable preparation god who can do whatever he wants? Batputer. Is he camp? Does he kill people or not? Like, what's Batman up to? What's he doing? What's he doing? Who is he even? Who is Batman? So, that's what I'm saying. I think Batman has. I don't think, unlike say the Boys, I feel that the Boys is a a really refined version of the comic book. It's gone through a refining process and come out better. Batman has gone through so many processes that he's become muddled. I think Batman now is a muddled character. I think kids growing up now aren't going to be into Batman because he's too muddled. And it's one of the reasons that the very defined characters of, let's say, Iron Man, Thor and Captain America are so resonating among young, new movie and comic fans. Because Mm. they can... What's Iron Man? He's a smug guy in a suit who will do what he can to save the day. That's pretty good. And does he kill people? Yes, he does. He kills people if he has to. Uh, yeah, and he he's really defined. No qualms. Captain America is very defined. Yeah, uh, Batman. Which Batman are you talking about? What a, yeah, exactly. That's the thing. That's a big thing. Which Batman are you talking about? It's like, well, I'm talking about Batman. Yeah, but you know, you can say, let's say, if we're having a conversation about the boys, I could ask you, are you talking about the comic book or the TV show? And we'll know which, one or the other. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if you say about Batman, 
Batman wouldn't do that. Are, are you talking about the comic book Batman or the movie, movie Batman? Because the movie Batman might. Well, which movie Batman? <laughs> yeah, well, that's the other are you talking about the Kristen Bale movie Batman? Or are you talking about the Ben, ben Schieffer movie Batman? Are you talking about the Michael Keaton movie Batman? Or are you talking about the... You know what I'm saying? Good God. Batman is very muddled. Yeah. People will often ask me, Ben, because, you know, not everyone in our circle of friends is into comics. What? Uh, I know, it's weird. But sometimes people say, Mick, you're a nerd. What's it, what's it like in the comics? Oh, as if you're the reference. You know what I mean? But yeah. as if there's a uh, the comic version that can answer it easily. Interesting. Like people will say, that new Dark Phoenix film, what's that like in the comics? Like, let me bloody oh, say. Oh, boy. Have a sit down here and let Papa Mick tell you what. <laughs> bloody going on that's a conversation that's probably actually happened there's a glint of memory <laughs> in his eye there <laughs> he's definitely used that line before Papa Mick either is going to tell you what's going on or he's going to make you a pizza well both are good Mick is an excellent chef for those that don't know he's been cooking a, a, a lasagna base a little lasagna um, with a bechamel nice. and my goodness it ladies and gentlemen nice, the it? smell when I came into this house today I'm not really a chef though Ben I'm a cook because I'm not in charge of a team of Oh, well, thank God for that. Yeah. God, the terror you'd bring to a kitchen. Oh, that would be unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, unbelievable. Sit down here now, young sous chef, and let me tell you about the Dark Phoenix saga. Come to Papa Mick. I'm trying to cut my fucking carrots, <laughs> Mick. Get out of my face. I like that our, our sous chef is Australian. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to cut my, my fucking carrots, mate. Just, just stay out of my face. It's, uh, it's you, Grant. No, it's you, right. Jackman. It's you, Jackman. <laughs> Falling on hard times. Broadway's dried up. Uh, uh, speaking people. of yeah, go on. Hugh Jackman one of the Marvel ones that we took a look at was, was the film Logan 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 did a great job of taking all the the gritty realness of someone like Wolverine go on from, especially from number two where it's all Rah! number two screaming. X-Men 2 or the Wolverine no Wolverine 2 the Wolverine the Wolverine mm-hmm. um, steroid steroid Jackman uh, jacked man He's always on the steroids. I know, but that's, you know, it's his job. It's his yeah, job, Mick. It is, I know. You can't look like... Can't think be... Brad Pitt was on steroids? Was Brad Pitt on steroids uh, in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? No, I don't think so. No, I, I wouldn't he like very so. fit, didn't he? He, he very, looked fit, but that's what... Very fit. That's what a fit 50-year-old smoker looks like. Yeah. Look, at you, Jackman and Brad Pitt aren't usually different in age. No. And you, you can see you, Jackman's vascularity. Very vascular. Very vascular. Very vascular. Very pumped. Yes, and that's all the roids. That's the steroids. Yeah, that'll, the be the steroids. steroids. that'll be the steroids. That'll be the steroids. <laughs> 50 year old men can't get in that shape with while, ease. With ease while they're spending the rest of the. Well, like, like it is Hollywood. They do have people getting them in that shape. Yeah, and then there's the dehydration technique that they use ben, a lot these days. If. If you had a Hollywood personal trainer and dietitian, look great. your abs would look like those soundboards. That'd be great, wouldn't you'd, it? You'd hurt a person <laughs> with my abs. With your abs. With my abs. But anyway, what are we talking about? I don't know. Um, Logan. 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 The adaptation of Logan. Yeah. So Logan was a great way of taking a character who was really just a murder machine for the first the couple days. of ones. In the olden days. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's always been an edgy character. Wolverine in general has always been real edgy. Mm-hmm. Real edgelord. Yeah. Um, especially mid-90s. But everyone was an edgelord in the 90s, so it doesn't count. But they did a great job in humanizing that character to a massive extent. Logan has made all these personal choices of looking after someone who looked after him at one point in his life and he doesn't abandon people anymore and kind of goes through that and you have that tragic, tragic ending. I don't um, think it was a tragic ending. It no, was, it was a good. well-deserved ending. It was a well-deserved ending for the character. But cool. it made me cry. Um, and I think they did a great job in that. You just see a man at the end of his rope for a lot of that film. Um, trying to make his way trying to make his way in the world um, but there's a lot more emotion brought to the character than was ever before and I doubt when Fox originally hired Hugh Jackman they realised how valuable he would be a couple of years later no. because he got some range, got some range. <laughs> um, because if they'd done that with anybody else I'm not sure you would have gotten the range well I mean well wow. he, he, he's had a long time to develop that character to the point where it's just him yeah yeah you know that's one of the big advantages of playing a character for a long time um, look at Thor. If if any of the recent Thor characters had been the first Thor film, the fans, Ben, there would have been bloody outrage. Yeah. Because this that is was an just outrage. Being, just bloody Chris Hemsworth yeah. in a fat suit. Chrissy Hemsworth. <laughs> I mean, if Chris Hemsworth hadn't been playing Thor for 10 years, that yeah. film would just be Chris Hemsworth in a fat suit. Yeah. And people it wouldn't would be work going, at all. What 
the heck is going on What there? did you do? I don't know, Ben, if I necessarily agree with you, though, that Logan represents uh, taking the edge off of Wolverine for the better. Okay. Because Wolverine in the movies, again, a bit all over the place, a bit of Batman syndrome mm, where muddled. he's not the most well-defined character. Like he'll kill you, he'll kill you, he'll, he'll kill a person. He'll do a killing. But then he'll be a bit conflicted about it. I suppose he's more he's more well defined than Batman, at least. Well, according to your, quite frankly, accurate, accurate theory. Yeah, accurate yeah. theory of Batman, <laughs> Batman. Quite frankly, accurate but theory. But I don't know if he was ever as edgy as, as, like, what did he do? He was more windy than edgy. There was a lot of gening about the place going, Gene, 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 Gene. Logan, Logan. <laughs> Yeah. Any other examples Podcast before we wrap it up? Gold. Um, the only other one I can think of is a very ill-fated attempt to de-edge something that nobody wanted to de-edge, which oh, is right. Lobo. Um, oh, yeah. So in the New 52... Bloody Millennial Lobo. Bloody Millennial Lobo. Hipster Lobo, Millennial Lobo, J. Crew Model Lobo. It doesn't matter what you call him. But basically, for anyone who doesn't know who Lobo is, Lobo is an intergalactic bounty hunter in the DC universe. And yeah. originally when he started up, he actually looked a lot more similar to the, the hipster Lobo. He wore a, a unitard mm-hmm. in, in purple and, and orange. Mm-hmm. And he had his big spiky hair and he yeah. had his space dolphins. And that's why he took bounties. Mm-hmm. He, ro- he rode around space on a thing. Um, and later on, he became much more of a parody character. He got a, a, got a, bit, of a, re- a bit of a reboot after one of the infinite crises yeah. on... Uh, Infinite Earth things, and he got a, a solid reboot to a proper space biker. Mm-hmm. And he's a very enjoyable character. He's completely over the top. Um, he's the last of a race called Zarnians. Um, he's the last one because he killed them all. He killed them all. Yeah, he committed an L an L genocide. Um, <laughs> and he got to work on one of those, and he wiped out his own race. <laughs> um, did not uh, expect that. No, I didn't expect that. That was good. <laughs> as you know, Ben. I find a mispronunciation <laughs> I know enjoyable. You do. Um, and he got involved in one of those, and he wiped out <laughs> his whole planet. But he takes bounties around the universe. Um, he has a perfect sense of smell. Um, and he's ridiculously overpowered, Michael. He, he, can, he can punch he, Superman there. He can punch Superman, no bother. He has undefined limit strength and he can't die. Mm. Lobo can regrow from nothing. He went through a period in the 80s and early 90s where uh, Tim Beasley, a uh, rather over-the-top illustrator, um, got his hands on him. With, it was either Simon Beasley or Tim Beasley. I can't remember. Was well, Ben, we've learned today that you can't be trusted with first It's names. a Beasley. No, it's I'm, I'm messing them up. It's probably Mark Beasley. Um, and they gave him a full reboot and they turned him into a parody character of all those edgy 90s tropes. Yeah. Um, and he got a lot of one-off specials where he would go to hell and he would wipe out hell so he could be reincarnated. Yeah. Um, he and he did Santa. all that. Um, and he's permanently banned from heaven and hell and he can't die. Yeah. However, people have a, a special place in their hearts for Lobo. He's a real fan favorite with DC people. Mm-hmm. And then Go the on. New 52 came around yeah. and they tried to make him into a hip, suave, no, educated he, thing. No, he, no good. And it turns out that the Lobo we all know and love was an imposter. And this 13 issue miniseries, which was cancelled after 13 issues because it was shite, um, <laughs> he beheaded Lobo. In the, the, the Lobo that we all know and love um, and that's what happened and fans were just like what are you doing? What are you doing? Why are you, Why are you taking none of us take this character seriously we love him but there's nobody here that wants him to be something else we don't need a reinvigorated Lobo so then when DC Rebirth came along which is quite frankly the better reboot they just went he's back nah that never happened <laughs> Did you see his recent appearance in Young Justice? As an Irishman? No, as not in Krypton. Oh, yeah. In Young Justice, he was very good. He was quite good in Young He's Justice. He's very good. The, that, is one of the, well, that is one of the big favourites is the Superman, uh, Tim... Bunchin. No, what's Miller. the name of the guy? No, no, Bruce Tim. Bruce Tim. Um, Mark Tim. M- Mark Tim. Um, Bruce Tim's version in this, the an- Superman the Animated Series was a real uh, fan favourite. Um, and he seems to be very well suited to animated adaptations. Um, he's great in the Young Justice series. Young Justice is very good. He's Irish though now. He's Emmett Scanlon. Yeah. I'm bloody, yeah, bloody Lobo. I'm bloody right. Lobo. I don't know why I, I am Irish and now I'm doing an English accent. All right. On that <laughs> note, ladies and gentlemen, uh, has anyone been watching Krypton? We don't watch Krypton. We don't watch Krypton. We probably should. Apparently it's quite good. Apparently it's quite good, Ben. Uh, apparently it's quite good. Don't bloody have time. We don't. We're so busy, So Michael. busy. Although I so did watch busy. all of Archer yesterday. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, 20 minutes is easy to get through, though. Yeah. We, we don't have the commitment episodes. for hour longs. We, we don't have hour long commitment. We don't have that much time. Um, except for this bloody podcast once a week. Oh, uh, <laughs> a chain around my neck. So, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. 
the albatross we all carry. Oh, um, we were very busy last week. We did a video for Comic Con. If you haven't seen that, oh yeah, give it a look. You can give it a look. Uh, get us, get, give us a look. Give us a comment. Tell us what you think, ladies and gentlemen. Follow all those nice people on Instagram. Follow all those lovely people on Instagram. They are genuinely nice people. We only include the nice ones. Um, no, that's not true. Sometimes we just have to leave things in the cutting room floor. Um, let us know what you thought of the video. Do you want me to cut all that out? No. <laughs> just cut all that out. <laughs> um, if you want to check out some of our other content, ladies and gentlemen, you can check us out on shomrabyug.com. That's S E O M or A B E A G dot com. Irish word for tiny room. Um, we are on Instagram as well if you want to see our shenanigans throughout the week. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are looking for a bit of uh, listener input. So if you have anything you'd like to see covered on the podcast, I got a tweet, Ben, saying we should do a Who Even Is Blade. No, well, we definitely will do that. It, it's definitely going to have to happen. Marshall Ali is Blade. Looking forward to it. Um, but also, Go but on. also, Go on. if you just want to get in touch with us, get just in touch hello. with us to showmanbuild.com. If there's anything you like about it, if anything you don't. Yeah, call um, the As always, ladies and gentlemen, your feedback is essential on the internet. Um, so if you want to give us an L review Go on review. Apple Podcasts, because iTunes is no more, um, it's just Apple Podcasts now, you can find us on Apple Podcasts and give us a review. They do help when you give us a review. More people will we listen. Go, we go up the algorithms. Yeah, the algorithm doesn't enjoy it does enjoy us as we go along. If you're a listener on YouTube, give us an L like. Um, and if you're a listener on Spotify, get in touch with us. Ben, tell us what you thought. We've only got about 20 listeners on YouTube now. Yeah, it's, but it's declined. It's it's quite odd, actually. It's really declined on YouTube because it's gone up on Spotify know, and other Spotify such places. and other places. But the people who listen on YouTube are really loyal listeners. Yeah, they're just <laughs> sticking it out. <laughs> the listening time is up through the roof. Yeah, yeah. But uh, well, thanks a bit to the twenty lads that are uh, listening <laughs> to us on YouTube. We really appreciate it. And um, that's it from us for this week. Bye. Bye.